Why was Christmas cancelled in Scotland for 400 years? And what was the massive upside? This is a very festive looking Edinburgh. Georgian architecture and sparkly stuff make it look like something off a Christmas card. Christmas has been massive here since at least the late 1950s. I'm not kidding. Every year you see newspaper stories about it being banned for 400 years. But that's not quite true. As always with Scotland and anything religious, it's complicated. The festival of Yule is thought to have been brought here by Germanic people, mainly the Vikings. Yule was originally a pagan celebration centred around the winter solstice. There were other pagan traditions dating back further though. The Clava Cairns near Inverness and the Mayshow Chamber in Cairn on Orkney both date back more than 4,000 years and they're both aligned to the winter solstice. That didn't happen by accident. Some think Yule could have been a sort of Norse Day of the Dead or a celebration of New Year beginning at the winter solstice. We can't know for sure, but it was clearly a way of marking the passage of time in the darkest days of winter and likely a way of appeasing the gods in the hope that the sun would eventually return. Having spent most of my winters in Scotland, I know the feeling. One of the first written mentions of Yule comes from the Anglo-Saxon chronicler, the Venerable Bede. As Christianity took over here and across Northern Europe, Yule became associated with Christmas. In Scotland, that might have had something to do with King Hakon I of Norway, otherwise known as Hakon the Good, who according to his very own saga, visited England and then returned to Norway and merged Yule with Christmas. Hakon was a secret Christian and put it into law. At that point in our history, the Western Isles were under his control, so you can see the connection. Like a lot of Europe, Scotland was Catholic, and Christmas, or Christmas, was a big celebration with feasting that lasted over a period of days, ending sometime around the New Year. There's a written record of Cardinal Beaton having passed over the Christmas days with games and feasting in 1545. That was just a few months before he was killed as a reaction to burning the Protestant George Wishart at the stake for heresy. And that's right around the point where everything was starting to change. From 1560, Scotland split from the Catholic Church in a period known as the Reformation. Cathedrals were damaged and abandoned. Anything seen as too Catholic, too superstitious or too extravagant was frowned on. This is John Knox, frowner in chief, the man who led the Reformation here in Scotland. This is St Giles Cathedral. Technically it's not a cathedral at all, it's actually a high kirk. Even though it says cathedral on the inside, it's the place where John Knox preached fire and beardy brimstone, like a sort of hangry anti-Santa Claus. He's actually buried somewhere in this car park. Christmas with its feasting and frivolity is thought to have been less of a celebration than Easter, but the new Presbyterian Kirk decided it had to be stamped out. In 1573, the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland confirmed the abolishment of all days that hereto have been kept holy except the Sabbath day, such as Yule Day, Saints Days and such others. In 1574, 14 women were admonished by the St Nicholas Aberdeen Kirk Session for playing, dancing and singing of filthy carols on Yule Day. Apparently they also had a problem with playing cards and dice, masked dancing with bells, selling Yule loaves, cross-dressing and extraordinary drinking. Behind me is Glasgow Cathedral and on December the 26th, 1583, the Kirk Session here ordered five people who had kept Yule to publicly repent, to sit on the black stool and be admonished in front of the congregation. This is the stool of repentance from Greyfriars Kirk. Anyone who was deemed to have sinned or celebrated Christmas in any way would have been made to sit on that in front of the whole congregation kind of like an ecclesiastical dunce's chair. In 1583, the Kirk banned bakers from producing Yule bread and mincemeat pies. They also made them report anyone who'd requested them. 
anything Christmassy was systematically banned by the church and people were threatened with excommunication. Although, having said all that, it started to sound quite attractive. But there was some opposition from the monarchy. James VI of Scotland became James I of England in 1603 and he wanted one kingdom and one church, with him in charge of the whole shebang. So he reinstated Christmas in 1617. But the church in Scotland banned it again in 1638, although that didn't become law until 1640 when the Scottish Parliament passed the first act discharging the Yule Vacants. It stated that the kirk within this kingdom was now purged of all superstitious observance of days. The act was partly repealed in 1686 with the restoration of Charles II. A second act discharging the Yule Vacants was passed in 1690 and that was repealed in 1712. Christmas was kind of becoming a glittery political football. This is Scotland though, and we do like to innovate. People couldn't put their energy into Christmas, not without consequences. So they decided to focus on something called Hogmanay. New Year was a secular celebration, beyond the reach of the church. People could do as much feasting and drinking and celebrating as they liked, just as long as there was no dancing. And as a result, Hogmanay got bigger and bigger here. But in spite of the best or worst intentions of the decidedly pious few, Santa slowly slid back in under the radar. That's probably a terrible metaphor to use in this situation, given the time period it happened in, but you get the picture. As the cultures north and south of the border became more integrated over time, and as Christmas got bigger and more elaborate in the Victorian era, it became more of a thing here. In 1841, the first Yuletide card was displayed in a window just down the road there in Leith. Christmas was made a bank holiday in 1871, but amazingly didn't become a public holiday here until 1958. That's nuts! For my grandparents' generation, it was just another working day. Hogmanay was the bigger celebration, with its own traditions and superstitions. But with the rise of TV and the influence of wider Western culture, Christmas became as big a celebration as New Year. We still like to go for it on Hogmanay though. You could argue that we got the best of both worlds. And as always, I intend to take full advantage. Whatever you're up to over the next couple of weeks, I hope you have a very happy holiday season.